The personal statement is a very important and central part of the process of applying to university in the UK. Especially true for subjects like law, medicine and dentistry, these subjects are incredibly competitive. And today I'm going to help you try and stand out from the crowd because today we are covering five key tips to writing a great personal statement. Hi guys, my name is Ollie. I'm a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. Now believe me when I say I understand that writing a convincing, gripping and above all interesting personal statement can be really difficult. In the UK we're really pretty reserved as a people and we're not used to bigging ourselves up trying to actively sell ourselves to an employer or a university. But after reviewing more than 200 personal statements for medicine over the last few years, I've picked up a few tips and tricks that I'm going to share with you today. And before we start my own tips, I'm going to give you one for free that comes directly from UCAS. A personal statement is personal. It applies to you and not someone else. And we need to remember above all else that the role of the personal statement, why we're actually doing it, is to tell the university why we are suitable for the course. That is what you're trying to get across. But the first of my five tips today is to make it about the course qualities. Each university course is really, really different, and that's why personal statements tend to look different depending on the course we're applying for. I think we'd all accept, for example, that if we're applying for an engineering degree, for example, that's going to look very different to how a personal statement for medicine or dentistry might look. And that's because the fundamental skills that are required to do well in that course are different. And finding out what those qualities are that we need to be ticking off in order to succeed is often as simple as looking either at the course prospectus or simply browsing the university website. If you're thinking about medicine, for example, as I suppose most of you are if you're watching this, they are going to want people who are friendly, knowledgeable in the sciences, compassionate and good at talking to and dealing with people. So these are the skills that you need to be trying to demonstrate in your personal statement. So you might be wanting to tell the school how you can demonstrate compassion. Have you had a part-time job? Have you done some work experience? Do you play as part of a sports team? How have you embodied those characteristics, these important things you want to cover in the things that you already do? And the examples that you give don't have to be directly related to the course. It's about those transferable skills. The second piece of advice today is to expand properly on your points. Perhaps the single biggest problem that I see when I'm reviewing personal statements is that they often read like a list of bullet points. I did this, I did that, I did something else. I got three A's in the sciences, I was captain of the cricket team, I was head girl for a year. Basically much of the time they read like a CV and it's not a CV, it's a personal statement. Because a CV is not a piece of persuasive writing, a CV is a list, it's a series of labels, whereas your personal statement both can be and should be so much more than that. Now I'm sure that you'll all remember from school the point evidence explain structure for persuasive writing. There's a reason that everyone uses this. So let's just work through an example together. So your point might be that I'm a good team player. I work well when surrounded by other people. Your evidence for that might be that you were captain of your school's netball team for a year. But then the value comes in the explanation. So I had to manage a team of my peers I had to make sure that every week when we played against other schools we were performing to a high level and I had to manage the situation if things weren't going so well. Sometimes for me this meant giving one-to-one -one coaching for other players on the team who I saw were struggling, paying attention to every single person on the team so that the team as a whole can succeed. From a relatively simple example, you were a player on a netball team, it shows a huge degree of insight and regardless of what degree you're trying to do, whether you're working as a nurse as part of the medical team, if you're working in a law firm or in a finance office, anyone who reads that is going to look at that and think, wow, this is a person that I want to work with. I want them on my team. And better yet, if you can then relate what you've just said to that context of wherever you want to work. And this is essentially where the limited characters that you have to play within your personal statement come in and need to be invested. This is where the value is. My next tip is to set a writing schedule. Because although a personal statement is actually a very short and concise piece of writing, the challenge is in getting that enormous amount of content and all those good things we want to say into less than a side of A4. I would recommend allowing at least a few weeks because that way not only do you have the time at the beginning to be a bit more abstract and to mind map out all your creative ideas, you can also send it out for review to different people in that time and that gives other people 
the time to respond to you properly. That's gonna be your major limiting factor if you leave it to the last second. Because fundamentally, we need to be doing a draft, sending it out, getting a review, making changes, and we need to go through this process two or three times before final handing. A rough structure you might want to follow if we're just gonna spitball ideas is for the first few days, do nothing but reflect on the experiences you've had. Try and make bullet points, list all of the things you've done that you might wanna talk about. And by the end of the first week, aim to have a very rough draft together. And this can and probably should be massively over the character and word limit. That's absolutely fine. That's not the concern at this stage. Send it out for feedback as soon as you have that first draft ready. And in the background, while you're waiting for the feedback to come back, continue to work and try and refine your ideas. In the second week, as your feedback starts to come back in, start to distill down your points. Try and work out which of the points you have you can develop fully and start to get rid of the ones that you can't. Because at this stage, you're now deciding where the value is. You can't talk about everything, that's not the aim. Your aim is to talk about the important things. Once again, at this stage, I would still expect you to be massively over the character limit. Cutting and getting things down is not the focus, the focus is still on the ideas. Once again, end of the second week, you should have a new draft, send that out, more feedback. Now that we're into the third week, this is all about cutting. The main idea is the structure and the concepts should pretty much be in place by now. So it's about bringing everything down and making it suitable for the final submission, acting on changes and feedback as suggestions continue to come in. I'd recommend trying to be done before the final two or three days. And that just gives you some last minute collateral time to respond to any disasters or problems with the process and make sure that you get handed in properly. That's three tips out the way, guys. We're more than halfway through. If you're finding this video useful, please consider hitting that subscribe button for me. It really helps out the channel. Point number four today, guys, is that you need to have other people checking your work. If you've ever tried to do any long form piece of writing, you know that it doesn't take long before all the words and letters start to jumble together and you start questioning whether words are even real anymore. But the fundamental crucial thing is that you become increasingly unaware of your own mistakes and it's really hard to spot them the more writing you do. There is absolutely no room for spelling errors, grammatical mistakes or wrong punctuation in your final hand in. That's just not acceptable. And another problem is ambiguity of meaning, things where sentences perhaps don't quite mean to a third party what we think they mean, and that's why you need someone else, someone disinterested, ideally who doesn't know you very well, to read through it and check that it makes sense and that they can understand this. And I can't stress to you enough that this is no time to be proud, right? You cannot be above feedback. If someone says to you, I don't really like how you've said this, this could be worded better, or I don't understand what you mean by this, you need to be changing it. Because quite frankly, a disinterested admissions tutor who's on their fifth coffee and 150th personal statement of the day doesn't care. They're not gonna put in the effort to try and interpret what you might mean by your statement. If it's not immediately apparent what you mean, that's it, you're done. And if you're absolutely adamant that some element of your story really needs to stay in, then that's fine, that's on you, but see if there is a way that it can be written better if someone doesn't quite get it. And it should go without saying that ask all of your reviewers to be as brutally honest as possible, because that's how you're gonna get the best feedback. Of course, your mum and dad should absolutely be looking at it, but the people you really need are your teachers, your school friends, what about your neighbours, your parents' work colleagues, people that aren't super familiar with how you think. The most ideal case would be someone who doesn't know you at all. You could even reach out to someone studying, you could even reach out to someone who's already at university studying the subject. Students are always gonna be happy to talk about the thing they're studying, so it might be worth a punt. And tip number five, the final tip for today, guys, is that you need to be telling a story. Narrative flow, in my humble opinion, is the single most powerful tool that you have at your disposal when trying to craft a personal statement. Because stories are essentially present throughout all of human culture, they pervade our entire history. We are evolutionarily hardwired to be receptive to storytelling. And essentially this is my long-winded way of saying that if you can provide an argument in the form of some sort of narrative flow with a consistent and clear structure, this is how you're gonna make the best argument. Let's say that I'm applying for a history degree, right? I might say something like, my interest in ancient history first appeared when my grandmother took me to an exhibition 
on ancient Rome. And I really enjoyed learning about all the different cultures that were present at the time. Then to learn a bit more, I either went back myself to a different exhibition or I asked for some work experience at the museum, or I spent some time reading more around the subject and this is what I learned. And I love this whole process and this is how I came to the conclusion that I should really be studying a history degree. It's very clear there how each point connects to the next one and there is a chronological order. So now we need to talk about flow. You need to be trying to use connectives and transition words to join your ideas together in some sort of coherent way. We're thinking about words like additionally, more, over, furthermore, however. Not only does this save a lot of our precious characters because we only have so many, because we don't have to establish two separate sentences, we can link two ideas together in one sentence, which is a lot more efficient. What actually happens if you use a word like however is that we innately know that we're meant to be contrasting two ideas and playing them off one another. It really is a situation where these sentences are more than the sum of their parts. And this is what's gonna separate good writing from average or even bad writing. And lastly, sequence is going to be incredibly important so that the reader can naturally follow the flow without having to expend effort. That means like all good stories that it has to have a beginning, a middle and an end. Turmoil is optional. And the end particularly needs to be some sort of conclusion about why you're doing what you're doing, why you would be suitable for the course, or ultimately what you're trying to achieve. What is the end point for you? Think of it like the conclusion to an essay. You've set out a series of arguments, you've given your evidence, what is your final summative comment? And that is gonna conclude this video, guys. My top five tips on crafting an excellent personal statement that'll get you where you want to be. If you found this video useful, I would really appreciate you hitting that like button, leaving me a subscribe on the channel so you don't miss more updates. I've got more personal statement videos to come and it helps me keep the channel free. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out my website, ollieburton.com, for more tips, tricks, and hints on grabbing your place at medical school. There are three ways you can support the channel. The first is by interacting with me. Leave me a comment, let me know what you would like to see videos on. The second is that you can use my Ko-Fi link to buy me a coffee and help keep me awake during the editing process. And the third is using my Complete Anatomy 2020, 2021 now referral link and you'll save 10% off your first year's subscription and I'll receive a small kickback when you do. Take care and I'll see you next time.